When we think of Madagascar, usually one of two images pop in our heads. The first of which is chameleons, the second of which is, well, a certain animated Sasha Baron character going, I like to move it, move it. Well, today we're going to talk about five good reptile and amphibian pets from the island of Madagascar that, again, make great pets. So, we're obviously going to get right into a pretty obvious one, the Dumeril's boa. So the Dumeril's boa are one of my favorite type of snakes. Um, this is James. He is a little squirrely and wonky. He got a little overheated before I got him, so he's always been a little squirrely which is why I usually have his girlfriend, Lily out, who's a little bit more calm, doesn't screw around as much, but she's preggers right now. So, James it is. Um, and then our little baby male doom rolls is a little small. So we're gonna stick with James you can actually see, even though he's not gonna stop moving. So, with that being said, doom rolls boas are the second largest species of snake on the island of Madagascar, being right next to Africa. But again, I decided to do Madagascar as its own because of how diverse and how many of endemic species are found just on Madagascar alone. So, second largest species of snake, the largest being the Malagasy ground boa, and the same family as these guys, looks a little bit different, gets a little bit bigger. Dumeril's boas are typically in that five to eight foot-ish range, with males being a little bit smaller, the females being larger. They're found in more of the southwestern part of the island. Um, it's a little bit less rainfall, by, but by all means, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily arid or a desert climate, although there are parts that are where these guys are found. It's just a little bit less annual rainfall than the northern part. Um, obviously, the first thing you notice about this guy, other than just the, like the size of a little bit larger snake, is this beautiful pattern. And every single one is different. Um, the pattern is meant to blend in with the model leaf color, the leaf cover of the ground. These guys are much more terrestrial as opposed to like the Imperators and some of the other new world boas that can climb up in trees and sometimes climb up. While these guys can do it, these guys are really built more for being on the ground. And, and this pattern made up of, you know, the broken dappled browns and creams and oranges and peach colors is meant for them to completely blend in. And if anybody ever has like a, especially a smaller, younger Dumeril's boa, and they have them in, uh, in a setup with like a nice deep layer of substrate, sometimes they just completely disappear into it and it takes you a second to go and find them. So as of before I said, they are a little bit more that terrestrial, that more sedentary kind of ambush, wait and hide. Um, a lot of that is demonstrated by their body shape. They're much heavier bodied than the Imperators and the Constrictors, and their tail is much shorter, like right here. That's his tail. It's really short. And generally, snakes that have a smaller, shorter tail usually aren't as inclined to climb trees. But with that being said, these guys are amazing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of snakes are killed on the island of Madagascar because of superstitions, uh, because of natives as well. Sometimes they will feel threatened by the larger ones like the Doomers and the Malagasy's but these guys are amazing pets. They've gotten very popular over the last couple of years. Like it was almost like the Mexican black king snake boom in popularity where their price almost seemed to like double overnight. Um, and hopefully we'll be producing our very first litter of uh, Dumeril's boas. I've talked a whole lot about them. I'll try to remember to put uh, the link to the video where I talk specifically about James and Lily here and we'll move on to the next one. Next up on the list is a very iconic Madagascar species, and that is the tomato frog. And I've actually learned quite a bit about tomato frogs since I had originally did my tomato frog and beginner amphibian video. So, learning as we go. So the tomato frogs, again, they are found on Madagascar. They're actually part of uh, the same genus called Dyscopus, and I know, and I, and. I'm looking it up and I know I mispronounced that, so again, as usual, I'm gonna put it up right here. But they're part of the larger group of family of frogs called the narrow mouth frogs. And in that genus of the three species, we commonly have two in the hobby, at least here in the States. And of those two, as I, again, just recently learned, there's essentially referred to as two different ones, and that is the true and the false tomato frogs. While obviously they're both closely related, part of the same genus or family, there is a difference with the same genus. Um, they call the true ones, they're a little bit more red and obviously a little bit more costly. They're a little bit more captive red. We don't see them nearly as often here in the hobby. Again, probably because they're a little bit more expensive. Um, I did learn uh, that like people like Josh's frogs, you're usually the ones that people will go to to try to find those true 
tomato frogs. And then the false tomato frogs are honestly the ones that I would venture to say that most people actually have in the hobby. I myself did have them as well. Those are the ones that are most likely all imports that are coming from Madagascar during different times of the year. And usually the imports are usually a little bit more inexpensive, so more easily obtained by people. Both of them still have that name tomato frog for a pretty obvious reason. They look like a little tomato. Really cool, that orange to red coloration with those big black bars. They're a very terrestrial species and they do like to dig down under leaf litter. So if you're gonna have one, you know, you need to make sure you have a fairly deep substrate with a couple different layers for them to hide under as well to kind of burrow down with again, a nice little fresh water source like you always would for amphibians. As far as temps go, the room temp for a lot of amphibians and things like that too, you know, in that mid 70s, over 80, 85 starts to get a little dangerous for them. They do very well on a nice varied diet of soft bodied insects, uh, sprinkled with calcium and multivitamins. Um, I've heard a lot of different information. A lot of it seems to kind of be leading to the fact that if it's a more hard body or hard shelled, like a larger dubia roach, um, they are, their digestive systems have a harder time processing that and it can cause them undue stress or possibly even, you know, a lot worse things down the road. So there are a number of varieties of foods, silkworms, mealworms, waxworms, small amounts of superworms, things like that, and even smaller crickets that all could do very well for that. Um, another interesting thing that I did learn is that there are specific things called carotenoids, which make up, are made up of keratin, which if anyone is in fish or can remember a few things about, you know, like, you know, high school science and stuff, uh, carotene or keratin is what goes into making that kind of orange red color. Like if you eat a whole, whole lot of it, eventually you'll kind of turn a different color. And there are like commercial fish foods, like for African cichlids or South American cichlids that have extra keratin in them to brighten up those oranges. And they have done a lot of research to find that the tomato frogs, unless they maintain a certain levels of keratin or keratinoids, they will start to lose that coloration in captivity or wild caught imports. That being said, they still make really great actual pet frogs. I really miss my pair. We did lose them. It wasn't during the move. It was after several, and may, I mean, maybe it could have just caused stress by the move. And it was, you know, after about a month or two, just that finally, they finally stressed or whatever had happened down the road. But they can live quite a while. And we had our pair for a number of years. And again, they were probably those imported ones. So who really knows? But I do look forward to eventually getting another few down the road and maybe possibly even getting the true tomato frogs as well. Now I know everyone's probably expecting me to list a chameleon at some point in time. And while personally I'm a little biased against them as being the best reptile pets, um, I'm not gonna really talk about chameleons in this video. Um, so sorry anybody waiting for one of those. But this next one is a snake that I think is really cool and that a lot of people may not know exist and that is the Malagasy giant hognose snake. So this snake, actually there's three different species across the island, but this one might be the most successful of any of the reptiles, amphibians, and possibly even animal on the island. They are very well adaptive. They're almost like the coyotes of Madagascar, where you're like, you know, coyotes here in the United States, they can kind of go anywhere and acclimate to any environment, make do. Well, they can kind of do the same. They can be found in the more drier, deserty areas close to where you'll find like some of the desert tortoises that are there. They can be found in rainforests. They can be found closer to urban inhabitants, although people don't really like snakes there a lot. Um, they can be found in popular camping sites and hiking trails. They're found all over the island. And as I said before, there are three different species and they're all doing fairly well. There's the speckled, there's the blonde, and there's the giant. The giants obviously are the largest species. They can get almost, well, they can get close to sometimes exceeding six feet long. That's a really big hognose, right? And again, they get their, their name just like they're, you know, the North American and South American with the tricolors, their contemporaries, they have the same reason. They have that upturned pig nose, so the hog nose, and they do use that to kind of dig and burrow into the ground a little bit. And there are quite a few similarities between the two. So again, the little hognose snout, they both will do hooding, which is a type of intimidation. So we all know that cobras are very famous for that big hood, the intimidation, they stand up, they go, mm, don't mess with me. And 
Cognos snakes also does something similar, more Easterns and tricolors than like the Western or the Plains, but they all will do it where they kind of flatten out their necks and huff and hiss, and they try to look in intimidating like a little false cobra, right? Well, the Madagasy, the Malagasy's also do that. They also do this kind of bluff, like a bluff bite, bluff bite. There we go, we got there eventually, where they don't actually bite down. A lot of times they will sit there because they have pretty big heads for the size of the snakes they are, and they just kind of like hit into you. They kind of bluff. A lot of times they won't even open their mouths at all where they just kind of like bump into you to get you to leave alone. And honestly, probably a bluff bite from a Malagasy would probably be a little bit more intimidating as opposed to like, you know, the little foot and a half long, you know, Western hognose versus a six foot giant Malagasy, right? Um, but that's a lot of the time where the, and, they're, and they do also have a little bit of rear fang venom. So we all know the hognose snakes, the tricolors, the Plains Easterns, they all are rear fang venomous. They still make very great pets. They're very reluctant to bite. The Malagasy's are as well. Although, as far as I'm aware, the total amount of recorded bites from them are less than 10. And of those, there has been no, and again, based on my research, which is not incredibly extensive, but I don't just read one Wikipedia article, that I could find that ever had any sort of medically significant reaction or occurrence of a Malagasy hognose bite. There have been a few um, more extensive reactions with like the Westerns than that we have before. But as far as I could tell, there's almost no reactivity or medically significant bites or reactivities from Malagasy giant hogs. They're also even more reluctant to bite. They're, as I said before, there's not a whole lot of records of them biting people. And although they haven't been kept as long or they're not as popular as the Westerns with all the morphs and stuff, they are gaining in popularity. In fact, they're one of the very few rear fang venomous snakes that I have personally handled. It was really cool just talking to somebody, just looking at a lot of the common snakes. And he goes, hey, do you want to see something cool? Goes back and after playing with like a couple different really fun morphs and some oddball species, he pulls out a five foot long Malagasy giant hog nose. It was really, really cool. Now, with that being said, that's kind of where the similarities end. They do differ in a number of ways. The first of which is obviously the size. When we think of, you know, hog nose for the most part, we think of, you know, the cute little guys. Well, quite a bit of difference in size. Um, they also don't play dead. There is no record or even like analogy or story of a Madagascar snake actually playing dead. We all know the Easterns are really famous for it. They do that and they roll over and they play dead as a defense mechanism. These guys don't ever really seem to do that. So if anyone, if you're allowed to keep hognose, maybe look into getting one of the three different species of the Malagasy giant hognose. The speckleds look like a really cool hybrid of like a giant speckled king snake and a hognose. And the blondes are you know, that kind of blonde, cool, creamy color. They're really fun. And then the giants essentially just look like a giant Eastern where it's that dark color on the top and kind of the creamy yellow white underbelly. Amazing species of snake. And honestly, one that I wish I was able to work with the where I'm allowed to here in Colorado, we can't have them, but it was really fun. And every time I travel and I get a chance to play with one, I will always jump on that chance. This next one may be a bit of a surprise and again, a little controversial for a number of reasons. And I'll get into that as we go along. But the next one on the list is the spider tortoise. So I normally don't talk a whole lot about tortoises being, being great pets. And that's because a lot of times people confuse great with good beginner. And there is a big difference. Ball pythons make great, wonderful pets, but not necessarily the best beginner first time reptile pet. Tortoises can be really good pets. And a spider tortoise honestly is a very manageable, easy tortoise once you know how to take care of tortoises properly. So we'll get into that. So the, tort the spider tortoise is one of the most endangered species of tortoises in the world because of essentially habitat loss and illegal poaching, both from, you know, the, the over in Eastern countries where it's used for traditional medicine as well as the illegal pet trade. Basically every animal that we have here in the United States has traceable lineages back. So that way we know that they aren't being poached. That being said, unfortunately, there's still something happening with kind of all species around the world. Bad people. We need to stop doing that kind of stuff. These guys are found down in the 
part of some of the most arid, dry parts of the island, the very southern, very, very southwestern part of the island. It's filled with a lot of cactus plants. It's very dry, very sandy areas. They don't get very large. Usually only about seven to 10 inches is like their carapace size, and they get their name for a pretty obvious reason. Their carapace or their shell has that really cool, interesting spiderweb looking pattern. And just like the Doomerol's bow and a lot of other species, they are all individual. They can range and vary from being very bold with light to more light with a lot, a lot or a little bit of dark spider webbing and colorations. They're all individual and they're really, really cool. They are a smaller tortoise species, like I said before. They have a little bit of a higher dome. So we're used to kind of seeing that more round like of like box turtles or sulcata that actually has been allowed to be outside for a while. They have more of a domed shapes, uh, dome shapes, domed shape shell. Ugh. Please don't get me tagged in another stuttering thing. Please, 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 please. These guys are really fun, but again, they are very endangered. So more than likely, they're, if you ever come across a spider tortoise, they're from someone who has been doing it for a very long time. They are legally allowed to be, you know, transported in and amongst the United States. That you, we can have them legally as long as they come from that, you know, well-known and reputable breeder, but they reproduce very slowly. Just like a lot of other very rare reptiles, they don't lay very many eggs. They don't reproduce very quickly. They hit sexual maturity at sometimes eight to 10 years old, and they only lay one egg at a time. So when we're trying to, you know, work with captive populations for reintroduction and building up and trying to diversify populations, it takes quite a while. However, if you do come across someone and you do desire that, you you know, I would really like to be able to, you know, I like the star tortoises and the stuff from like Sri Lanka and India and places like that, but I really like the spider tortoise and you do find someone that has that reputable um, lineage and they do have some and you want to become a part of the community that's going to be taking care of this really amazing endangered species of tortoise, the actual care for them isn't as bad as a lot of them because they're smaller, they don't need as large of an area, but again, it's a tortoise. The more room you give them, the better. They do really well at not crazy high temperature swings. And again, they do very well on a nice varied diet of dark leafy greens and even some prepared tortoise food. Really, really cool species. And of all, and we all know kind of about the invisible arc at this point, right? Like where a lot of people, you know, if we have them in captivity in zoos or in other places, if eventually, you know, human hubris takes over and they've and we've lost all the wild animals we'll still have some for hopeful either for future generations to be able to see or to be reintroduced back into the wild it doesn't really happen a whole lot with like private individuals like us even though we would take meticulous time and care and energy and effort to make sure that we do have a lot of diverse and varying and a nice good population in captivity the spider tortoise is in fact going to, is one of the ones that is being worked with more with private individuals because there is some acknowledgement that we as private keepers do in fact know quite a bit and care quite a bit about the individual animal species that we keep. And they are the one, one of the ones more likely to be part of reintroduction into the wild through private keeper and historically, you know, like zoological means and cooperation. The last one I'm gonna talk about is similar to chameleons where it's definitely a display species. And while not necessarily as impressive or as iconic in herpetoculture, it is definitely iconic in a different way. And that is, I'm actually gonna be talking about a group of reptiles, and that is the day geckos of Madagascar. So obviously, immediately, immediately we're all gonna think of uh, a certain car insurance icon that we're not going to talk because of, you know, liability issues or whatever. Yeah. But there are quite a few different species and genuses all found throughout the island of Madagascar of geckos, but I'm talking specifically about the genus Felsuma de geckos. And again, if I mispronounce that, put it right here. You can yell at me later. But these guys are a really good group of lizards that can be an amazing reptile as long as we're really talking about display species. They're not really great for handling, but they can still be a great and appreciative display animal. So of the Felsuma genus, there's roughly 30-ish species found mainly on Madagascar, but there's one or two found on mainland Africa and a couple others that are also found on some of the islands in the Indian Ocean. 
And in addition to those 30 full, you know, taxonomy species, there's, there are 40 of those, there's even another 30 subspecies. So if you're ever looking into that and you see the number 70 plus thrown around, that's kind of why there's a lot of species and then a lot of subspecies as well. Very diverse, but they're all very amazing animals. They can be as small as like, you know, the gold dust, the peacocks or the Kellys that are, you know, two and a half to four inches long. And then the largest being those giant crimson day geckos or the giant day geckos that are sometimes close to a foot, which is a very wide range of things. But that being said, they're all very similar in their body shape. They're all diurnal geckos and they are the true geckos. So they don't have the eyelids unlike, you know, the fat tails and the leopard geckos. So they have to use their tongue to actually clean and hydrate their eyes. As being diurnal, they're very active, which also makes a really great display species. A lot of reptiles are crepuscular. So you can have this very active, fast moving gecko that you will actually be up and awake to see move around. They do very well on both commercially prepared foods like the Pangea and the Rapashi diets, as well as on a multitude of small insects and even pollen and nectar and even small bits of fruit that they will also eat out in the wild. They're kind of generalist. They do eat a lot of insects, but they will eat the nectar or the pollen and little fruits and things like that. Really, really cool species. And again, very diverse, both in size and colorations. There's, you know, the giants that are the bright green with the reds. They're the standing eyes that kind of have that blue. There are the little peacocks, the gold dust, all of a bunch of really, really cool species. There's about 20 or so that are more commonly kept in the hobby that we'll really have access to. But you know, if you start doing digging, you start looking and play in to specific people eventually down the road, you can find some even other really cool ones. Um, they're all fairly arboreal. They have like a lot of geckos, they have those toe pads where the toe pads are spread out and they have those really small little mi microscopic little hairs that essentially create those electromagnetic fields that allows them to cling on glass and rocks because their toes are basically vestigular, their little, clo their little claws, so they can't actually like, grip the things very well. But those little fur, those little, little hairs make it so they can grip both smooth and rough surfaces very well. They're very arboreal. So again, if you want to keep them in any sort of fashion, a more vertical arboreal setup works very well. They're very great and a uh, great species if you want to go towards bioactive because that's also doing very well right now. It's getting very popular, which is a very good thing. But again, also remember if you want to go more naturalistic versus bioactive, they are diurnal. They do require UVB. I know there's a lot of holdouts and things about UVB. They do need both UVA and UVB lighting. So make sure you give them that. A little bit of a warm spot. Doesn't need to be crazy high, like 100 something degrees. You know, the mid 90s always works pretty well for a nice little hot spot to give them a gradient to move up and down with. Really cool species. You can create amazing naturalistic terrariums. And if you have a large enough one, you can even keep them in pairs of females or in like trios, again, depending on the size of them. They do very well and you can create like, it could be the centerpiece of a room. I know a lot of people are starting to do that where they have a large vivarium terrarium and they have small little species like reed frogs or the small little geckos or even, uh, I saw someone that had a bunch of grass lizards in one and they just kind of built their their den or their living room around there. So that's also really cool. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this enjoyed this video as well. Sorry, stuttering a little bit. Um, apologize for the wind noise going on in Colorado. It's just been crazy windy and it is like this entire week. So I'm gonna do my best to try to not have too much of that noise in the back, but I really, this is the chance that I have to make quite a few videos. So apologies in advance for that. You're gonna hear a little bit about that, but I'm wearing this. Hopefully cuts down on it. If you guys love these videos, please let me know down below. Although they usually see me doing more, doing pretty well. I'm whittling down on the number of places that I can actually do this anymore. We've hit most of the continents, don't have too many left. So if you have any ideas for future videos and content like that, I do pay attention to them. I'm gonna try to get to the ones that I actually physically have in front of me before moving on to other ones that are commonly kept. But I am paying attention, I am listening, I'm writing them down. So please feel free, let me know down in the comments. You can email me for questions, comments at jayzsreptiles at gmail.com as well as all of my other social media nonsense. Hope you guys are having a great day and we'll check you next time. I know.
are such a bad 